How's it going y'all? Let's learn Go today. This is an awesome language to learn and so let's start this tutorial right away with six main points you should know about the Go language. First, Go is a statically typed language which means that you have to either declare variable types explicitly or they have to be inferred. And these types cannot change afterwards, at least not without type conversion which we'll get into in another video. Here's an example where I'm creating a variable named my variable. In Go I have to specify its type when I create it. For example, a string type or I have to set it to something right away so it can be inferred what it is. In this case, the value is a string, so the variable is inferred to be of type string. Go is also strongly typed, i.e. the operation you can perform on the variable depends on its type. For example, in Go, I can't add an integer and a string together. In a weakly typed language like JavaScript, on the other hand, this is allowed. Go being a statically and strongly typed language has its advantages in that the compiler can do more thorough checking of your code for errors and force you to fix bugs before you can even execute your program. You also tend to get better code completion and hinting when developing as it's more clear what each variable is in your code. Go also comes with a compiler which translates your code into machine code, producing a binary file which can be ran as a standalone program. This in contrast with some languages like Python which use interpreters. These translate the code line by line as the code is running, adding some overhead which can make the execution much slower as compared to executing a pre-compiled binary file like Go produces. Here's an example where I'm running a loop counting to 100 million in both Go and Python. The execution time in Python took about 6 seconds in my machine and about 50 milliseconds in Go. That's about 120 times faster. This gives you an idea of interpreted versus compiled speeds. A next feature of Go is that compilation time itself is very fast. Being able to go from the code you wrote to a runnable binary without having to wait around a long time makes the testing process a lot nicer for developers like us. We could write a piece of code, compile it, and test it pretty quickly. Go also has built-in concurrency. You don't need special packages or workarounds to get parallelism working in Go. This is built into the language, done with what's called Go routines, which we'll explore Explore more in a later lesson. And finally, simplicity. This is the general design philosophy of Go. Its syntax is pretty concise, you can do a lot of things while writing less lines of code, and it also has things like garbage collection, which automatically frees up unused memory, so this is something you don't have to manage yourself. So that's the main overview of what Go is about. So let's get into setting up our environment so we can start writing some code. The easiest way to do this is to go to the Go website and go to slash doc slash install. This will give you the installation instructions for Linux, Mac, and Windows. So you can choose the platform you're on and follow the instructions there. So I'm on Mac and the instructions tell me to just go download the installer and run it on my system. To check if it's installed, you can run Go version in a terminal or command line and you should get something like this. Alright, so we're good to go. Let's now start our first Go project. But first make sure to hit the like button as well as subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the videos in this series as they come out. Alright, so the first thing we gotta do is initialize our Go project. So let's start by making a folder called Go Tutorials and CD into that folder. Before we initialize the project, there are two things we gotta know about the structure of Go code. These are the concepts of modules and packages. A package is just a folder that contains a collection of Go files. Then a collection of these packages is known as a module. And when we're initializing our project, we're really initializing a new module. So to start this new project slash module, we type in go mod in it and then the name of your module, which can be whatever you want. Usually it's named to be its location in a GitHub repository. That's what you'll see most commonly. For this series, I'll call it go tutorials, though all the code for this and upcoming videos is going to be available on my GitHub. So this will create a go.mod file, which is your modules package. Let's take a look at what's inside. As far as an editor, you can use whatever you want. Vim, NeoVim, VS Code, PowerPoint. I'm going to use NeoVim. So the go.mod file contains the name of our module as well as the Go version we're using. In addition, if we start installing external modules in our project, which other people have created, it will have those there as well as the version number. We'll make sure to check back here when we install some. We'll get into the conventions for structuring your folders for your Go projects in a later video, but for now, let's make a CMD tutorial one folder. In this folder, let's create a main.go file and open it. So remember, every Go file is part of a package, and we identify the package that it belongs to at the top of the file by typing package and then the name of the package, which has to be the same for all files within this folder. Here, let's use the package name main. This is actually a special package name that tells the compiler to look for the entry point function here, i.e. when creating an executable, the compiler needs to know where the program should start from, and it will look for a function named main within this main package, which serves as the first thing that will get executed in your program. You can see that my editor is in 
indicating that there's an error here. This is because I haven't yet created the main function which is required in the main package. This only applies to the special main package. For example, if I had another folder with a package called blue, I wouldn't have to make a function called blue anywhere. To create a function in Go, you use the func keyword followed by the name of your function. This function does not take any parameters and we use the curly braces to signify where the code for the function goes. You can see we created the main function and the error has gone away. For this tutorial, we're just going to print something to the terminal and for that we're going to use the FMT package which is built into Go. To import the package, we go just under the package name declaration and then type import and then the package name. You can see right away that you'll get an error when you do this. This happens because Go doesn't let you import packages and then not use them. So let's make sure we use this import in our main function and you'll see the error go away. So to use the package, you type FMT and then the name of the function you want to use inside the package. In our case, we want to use the print line function. This will take the string that we pass in, append a new line character and print that to the console. You can see the error that we saw above has gone away. All right, so let's save and see how we can run this program. We currently have the CMD folder and the go.mod file. To compile our program, you can use the command go build cmd tutorial one main.go. This produces a binary file you can see here called main. Now we can run this file and get our hello world output pretty cool. You could also use a go run command. This will do the same thing we just did, which is compile the code and run it, but in a single command. This is what I usually use. Okay, awesome. Now we made our first go program and we got the basics of go down. Now let's move on from the appetizer to the next part of this course. Here we're going to get familiar with constants, variables, and the various basic data types built into Go. All right, here we are in our main package with our main function and FMT imported so we can print a few things as we go. Pun. So to declare a variable, we use the var keyword, then the variable name, then the type. Here I have a variable named int num with its type set to int. Int is a basic built-in type in Go, signifying that the variable int num stores an integer. You can see that the compiler is showing me an error. This is because just like imports, you have to use every variable you declare. This is part of Go's simplicity design philosophy, where the idea is that code should be easy to read and understand. And part of that is that you don't have any pointless variables hanging out in your code. So every time we declare a variable, I'm going to use a print statement, which will print its value to the console. In addition to the int type, we also have int8, int16, int32, and int64. These are used to specify how much memory or bits you want to use to store your number. 64-bit ints, for example, can store much larger numbers than 16-bit ints, but take four times more memory. The largest positive 16-bit integer, which can be stored in an int 16, is 32,767. If I try to initialize a variable with a number larger than that, I get a compiler error. More specifically, this is an overflow error. Note that the compiler won't throw any overflow errors at runtime. So if I do this, when I run the code, I won't get any errors show up. In fact, it'll continue to our print statement without any issues and print this. So the program will still run but produce weird results. Moral of the story is think about what data types you're using as well as what values you might encounter and avoid late night debugging sessions where you're this guy. Note that int will default to 32 or 64 bits depending on your system architecture. We also have access to unsigned ints which have all the same bit sizes as ints but only store positive integers. And because of this you can store integers twice as large in the same amount of memory. Next we have float32 and float64. Similar to int, these are 32 and 64-bit floating numbers used to store decimal numbers. 64-bit floats can store the largest and most precise decimal numbers but they take more memory. In this case Go doesn't have just a float type. We have to specify either 32-bit or 64-bit. If you want to know in detail how floating point numbers are stored in your computer, check out my video linked here. But essentially most floating point decimal numbers won't be stored precisely on your computer. For example this 32-bit number, when we print it to the console, we don't get the exact number back. We get actually how the number is stored in your computer. This is a function of the 32-bit precision that we chose. If we store the same number in a 64-bit representation, we get the correct number back. It's good practice to think about what data types you want to use and not always going for float64 or int or int64. For example, if I want to store 256 RGB, an unsigned 8-bit integer is the best fit, rather than using an int, which would be 64 bits in my system. So by the way, if you like these sort of fast, no time wasted tutorials, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe so you don't miss future videos as they come out. Now obviously you can add numbers together, multiply them and all that stuff, but two things to note about arithmetic operations. One, you can't perform operations with mixed types. For example, I can't add an int and a float32 together or multiply an int32 with int64 for example. If I need to do this operation, I can cast one of the numbers to a common type like this, which works by converting the integer variable into a float32. Secondly, integer division results in an integer and the result is rounded down. So here three divided by two is one. If you want to get the remainder 
or here you can use the percent or modulo sign. Next let's take a look at the string type. So this might blow your mind but you use the string type to store strings. So you can initialize a string with a value using double quotes or back quotes. So with double quotes it's just a single line. I can't for example continue my string onto the next line. I can insert a line break character using a slash n though. So this is what would get printed to the console. With back quotes you can format the string directly and this is exactly how it will print out. We can also concatenate strings together by adding them. Now this is where strings get a little tricky. We can get the length of a string using the built in len function but note that this isn't the number of characters in the string. It's the number of bytes. Since Go uses UTF-8 encoding, characters outside the vanilla ASCII character set are stored with more than a single byte. So taking the length of this ASCII character will give you a 1, but taking the length of the gamma symbol, for example, gives you 2. So if you expect some fancy strings in your code and you want the length of a string and the number of characters, you can import the built-in package unicode slash UTF-8 and call the rune count and string function. Sounds like a weird name for a function which finds the length of a string, but runes are actually another data type in Go and represent characters. If you use a single quote like this, you got yourself a rune. We'll do a deeper dive into strings, their UTF-8 encodings in Go, and how they relate to runes, as well as the byte type in a future video. But they're not super useful right now, and what we've covered is really enough for 95% of use cases, so... That's all I have to say about that. For now. Lastly, we're going to cover booleans. These are super easy. They can be either true or false. You now understand booleans in Go. Up to now, we've always initialized a variable where we've declared it, but this isn't required. We could create an int variable, for example, like this. In these cases, Go sets default values for our variables, where the default value depends on its type. For an integer, the default value is zero. So the default values for all ints, unsigned ints, floats, and runes is zero. For strings, it's the empty string, and for booleans, it's false. We could also create a variable but omit the type if we set the value right away. This way the type is inferred. We could even go a step further and drop the var keyword as well and use the shorthand colon equals. If you want to be real fancy, you can initialize multiple variables at once in all the same ways we initialize a single variable. Now I tend to specify the type explicitly whenever I can and when it's not obvious. So in this case, initializing my var with a shorthand is fine because it's obvious that this is a string type variable. But suppose I have some function foo I imported from somewhere which returns some value. Now if I use shorthand here, I really have no idea what my var is unless I hover over it, if I'm in an editor that can do that, or I can go to the definition of the function to see what it's returning. Is this a string, an int, or something else? Adding the type when it isn't obvious is good practice and will make your code easier to follow and you'll make the coding gods happy. Now constants are alternatives to variables. Everything we said before also applies to constants except you can't change its value once it's created. Also you can't just declare constants so for example I can't do this. I have to also initialize it with a value explicitly. Constants are useful when you don't want code down the line to change the value you've set. Let's say I want to set the value of pi. There really isn't any reason for anyone to change this and doing so will mess up any calculations we may be making. So const is a good choice here. All right, let's jump into functions and control structures in Golang. We've already gotten a preview of functions with our main function, but let's start by defining another function right below it. As we already know, we use the func keyword followed by the name of the function. We use matching parentheses, this is where our parameters will go in a second, and curly braces to store the logic of the function. Note that I have to put the starting curly braces up here on the first line, otherwise I get an error if I do something like this. The closing curly braces you can put wherever you want. Let's write a print statement in here so we can see when this function is executed. So I can call this printme function from our main method by just writing this. If we run our main.go file, we see that the main function executed the printme function which printed this to the console. With functions, we have the ability to pass in parameters and these go between the parentheses. Suppose instead of assuming what you want to print, the printme function takes in a parameter of type string and we'll print that instead. We can define an input value like this where the name of the parameter is print value and the type is of type string. I can define a variable in our main function and pass it into the printme function and it will print this to the console. Now the parameter type is enforced so I can't pass in an integer to this function in place of a string. 
Now suppose I want to make a function which does integer division for me and returns a value. Let's call this function int division and it takes two integers, numerator and denominator. So when you have a function which returns some value to the caller, you have to specify the type that it's returning here like this. So I just have to let go know that this function is going to be returning an integer back after it's done executing. Now we get an error here because currently the function is not returning anything. So let's fix that. Let's do our integer division and to return the results we use the return statement like this. In our main function, we can define our result variable to take the value that the int division function returned, and let's print that out to the console. Now you can also return multiple values at the same time. So suppose I also want to return the remainder value of the division. I can specify that this function is going to return multiple values by using parentheses and then multiple types like this. Again, let's fix this error by honoring the return types we specified for this function. Like we saw, we can get the remainder values using the percent sign, and then we can separate our return values with a comma. In our main function, we can just insert our second variable like this, which will hold the remainder value. Let's print the result to the screen. Except now let's start using the printf function instead of the printline function. With the printf function, we can format the string a bit easier using variables. I can add a percent %v to the string, and then when it gets printed out, it will replace this value with the variables I've set here. So the first percent %v will be our result, and the second will be the remainder. One thing you might be asking is what happens if somebody passes in a zero for the denominator? Let's try it. Well, we get an integer divide by zero error. A design pattern in Go is that if your function can encounter errors, to have a return type of type error along with the values you're returning. Now, error is another built-in type in Go, and if we initialize a variable of type error in our function like this, the default value is nil. So nil is a default value for a bunch of different types, similar to how zero was a default value for ints. We can check that the denominator is not zero by using an if statement. We use the keyword if followed by the condition and then the code that we want executed. Again, this goes between the curly braces similar to functions. So if the denominator is zero, we want to return our error variable because this is an invalid input and we want to notify the caller that something went wrong. To create an error type, let's import the errors package where we can call the errors.new method. This creates an error type that we can initialize with an error message. We still have to return two integers, so we can set those to zero. Since we're also returning the error variable, we have to add the error type to our return definition at the top of the function. So if the denominator is not zero, the code will continue, return the result, remainder, and the error, which is nil. Now it's the job of the caller to check if an error was returned. So we capture the error value with a new error variable, and we check if it's not nil, meaning an error was encountered. In this case, we'll just print the error message by calling the error method like this. Note that you can check if two things are not equal using the exclamation equal sign and check if they are equal using the double equal sign. I also wanted to note that handling errors in this way is a general design pattern in Go. If you import functions from other packages, a lot of the time they will return an error type in addition to other outputs. So what we've done here is exactly how you would check if something went wrong and handle it accordingly. Let's flush this out a bit more by adding some more control structure here using else if. An else if statement will only check its condition if the previous if or else if statement was false, otherwise it gets skipped. So let's print a different message depending on whether there's a remainder. At the end, we'll use an else statement, which is the default if all the statements above are false. In Go, the else if and else statements have to be on the same line as the last bracket. Now you can make multiple logical checks within the same conditional statement if you need to as well. For example, here's an if statement where we use the double ampersand symbol to indicate that both these checks have to be true in order to execute the print statement here. There's also the OR operator with two vertical bars. Here only one check needs to be true in order to execute the print statement. Now Go will only execute the checks it needs to and ignore the rest. For example here, since the first check evaluates to true, there's no need to check the second since this is an OR statement, and it will continue directly into executing the print statement. Similarly for the AND case, since this evaluates to false, it will not perform the other checks. Alright, getting back to our code example, we could have also written these if else statements using a switch statement. Let's just paste that in and take a look. We set up a switch block here using the switch keyword and within the curly braces we have the various cases, exactly the same as with our if else statements. For example, if the error is not nil, we would print out the error message and then the code would break out of the switch block, i.e. we wouldn't check the other cases. If you're coming from another programming language with switch statements, note that the break is implied. So we don't need to write them out explicitly for each case in Go. So from a logic perspective, this is a equivalent to the if else statements we wrote before. Now Go also has conditional switch statements which are slightly different. Suppose we want to print out additional values to the console depending on the value of the remainder. If we write a switch statement but this time we insert the remainder variable between the switch keyword and the opening curly brace, we have a conditional switch statement. Now we can check if the remainder is equal to zero like this. 
If it's one or two like this, and anything else will evaluate to the default statement. In part four, let's check out arrays, slices, maps, as well as how loops work in Go. So first let's start with arrays. So an array is a fixed length collection of data, all of the same type, which is indexable and stored in contiguous memory locations. Let's explore these four points by declaring an in32 array and going through the syntax. The first thing to note is a set of square brackets with the number three. This indicates that the array holds exactly three elements. Note that the length of this array cannot change after it's initialized. Directly following is the type. This specifies that all the elements in the array are of type in32. When declaring an array, the default values are set to be the default values of the element types, which as we saw previously for in32 was 0. So we get an array here of three zeros. I can also index this array, i.e. access the ith element in the array like this, or access element 1 and 2 like this. Go is zero index, meaning that the first element is at index zero, and the second is at 1, and so on. I can also change the value of any element by using indexing as well. Since an int32 is 4 bytes of memory and our array stores 3 elements, Go allocates 12 bytes of contiguous memory when we initialize the array. We can print out the memory location of each element using the ampersand symbol. We'll do a deeper dive into memory and pointers in a later video, but for now I just wanted to note that these are stored in contiguous memory locations, i.e. the first in32 is stored in the first 4 bytes, the second in the next 4, and so on. The benefit of this is that the compiler doesn't need to store memory locations for each element. It just needs to know where the first byte is stored and can just increment by 4 to get the location of the next. We could have also immediately initialized the array using this syntax. or using the colon equals shorthand like this. We could have even omitted the three here and have this number be inferred by the compiler using the dot dot syntax. So this is still an array of fixed size three because we set three elements here. Now related to arrays are slices. According to the Go documentation, slices are just wrappers around arrays. So under the hood, slices are just arrays with some additional functionality. Let's take a look at an example. By omitting the length value, we now have a slice. With slices, unlike arrays, I can add values to the slice using the built-in append function. This function takes the slice as the first element and the value you want to append to the end of the slice as the second. It then returns the slice with the new element appended. So what's actually happening here with respect to the underlying array? Well, initially an array is allocated that can hold exactly three values. When we go to append another number, a check is done to see if the underlying array has enough room for four values. In this case, it does not. So a new array is made with enough capacity and the values are copied there. So in this case, we got a totally new array back, meaning one stored in a different memory location. We can print out the length of the underlying array before and after using the cap built-in function. This is called the capacity of the slice. So initially, the length of our slice and the capacity is the same, but after appending a value, the length of the slice is now four, but the capacity is six. So the underlying array went from this to this. This is the length of our slice and this is a capacity. Note that I can't actually access the values here in the slice as I'll get an index out of range error. Now you can also append multiple values to the slice by using the spread operator like this. Another way to create a slice is using the make function like this. We can specify the length of the slice as well as optionally specify the capacity of the slice. Otherwise, by default, the capacity will just be the length of the slice. You might want to specify the capacity if you have a rough idea of how many values you're ultimately going to need the slice to hold. This avoids your program having to reallocate the underlying array when it needs to store more values, which can have a pretty large impact on performance. We'll do a speed test at the end of this video to see exactly how much reallocation of arrays can actually slow things down. All right, so let's move on to maps. This is another very useful data structure implemented in most programming languages, including Go. So a map is a set of key value pairs where you can look up a value by its key. We can create a map using the make function again with this syntax. This means that the keys are of type string and the values are of type unsigned int eight. Alternatively, you can initialize a map with values immediately like this. Now I have a mapping here of people and their age, and I can get the age of Adam, for example, like this. Note that if I try to get the value of a map using a key that does not exist, I'll get back the default value of that type, i.e. in our case our values of type unsigned int 8, which has a default value of 0. So here you have to be careful in Go because the map will always return something, even if the key doesn't exist. Luckily, maps in Go also return an optional second value, which is a boolean. This is returned as true if the value is in the map and false otherwise. This way you can handle the two cases by checking the value of the returned boolean variable. 
To delete a value from a map, Go has a built-in delete function where the first argument is a map and the second is a key. This will delete by reference so no return value is given. Now we can iterate through maps as well. For that, let's talk about loops in Go. If you want to iterate over something, be it a map, array, or a slice, we can use the range keyword within our for loop like this. So the name variable is initialized within the for statement itself using the colon equals syntax. Note that when iterating over a map, no order is preserved. So when I run this loop multiple times, I'll get a different ordering of the keys. If we want to also return the values, we can do that like this. Similarly, we can iterate over arrays and slices like this, where i is the index and v is the value in the array or slice. So Go does not have while loops per se, but this loop type is achieved with the for keyword again. For example, this is your while loop in Go. It will continue until i is greater than or equal to 10. We can also totally omit the condition as well and instead use a break keyword here which will end the loop again when i is greater than or equal to 10. Finally, the same thing could also be achieved with this syntax. There are three distinct parts here separated by semicolons called the initialization, the condition, and the post. So i is initialized here with a zero value and this is where the loop starts and it will continue as long as this statement is true, i.e. as long as i is less than 10. The post is what gets executed every time the loop is completed. In this case, i++ means increment i plus one. Note that there are other shorthands like this available like i minus minus which decrements i by one, as well as a bunch of others for all four basic math operations which you could use as well. All right, as promised, let's do a speed test showing the benefits of setting the capacity of your slice ahead of time if possible. So here we're gonna append 1 million elements to our test slices. The first test slice is gonna be empty with zero capacity, and the second is also gonna be empty, but with a pre-allocated capacity of 1 million. So I have this time loop function, which takes in a slice and the number of iterations. It uses Go's built-in time package to measure how long it takes to finish the loop and then returns a result. We can see that this takes about three times longer when initializing without a preset capacity. So you get it. I get it. Let's take a deeper dive into strings and see how they relate to runes and bytes and golang. We'll use the word resume here as our demonstration string for this video, mostly because it has these non-ASCII characters which will help us understand strings and go a bit deeper. So first we can index a string just like arrays using the same notation. When we print this out to the console though, we get something curious, we get a number. Let's print out the type of the index value using the printf statement and percent %t. So even weirder, this is an unsigned int 8. If we iterate over the string with the range keyword where i is the index and v is the value, we get an output like this. The first column is the index where we get 0, 1, skips 2, 3, and so on. And the second column is a bunch of numbers again. To understand what's happening here, let's make sure we understand UTF-8 encoding, which is how Go represents strings on your computer. So remember, we have to represent strings as binary numbers in computers. One such early way of doing this was using the ASCII encoding. This uses 7 bits to encode 128 characters. So for example, the letter A is the 97th ASCII character, which is this in binary. But what do we do if we want to represent an extended set of characters like emojis or Chinese characters, for example? One obvious way of solving this would be to use more bits. For example, we could extend our character representation to use 32 bits or 4 bytes. This is exactly what UTF-32 encoding does. But this can waste a lot of memory for many characters. For example, here's the letter A in UTF-32. It'd be nice if we didn't need to have all these zeros here as well to represent this. UTF-8 on the other hand seeks to solve this issue by allowing variable length encoding, i.e. using the appropriate number of bytes for the character. UTF-8 uses a predefined encoding pattern which encodes information about how many bytes this particular character uses. For example, you can tell that a character uses one byte if it starts with a zero, two bytes if it starts with a one one zero, and so on. So the regular ASCII characters use one byte and anything beyond that uses two or more. The acute E character has a Unicode point number of 233. Unicode characters numbered between 128 and 2047 use two bytes and hence this pattern. 233 in binary is this. We need to pad this number with leading zeros in order for it to fit into the UTF-8 encoded representation like this. 
So this is now our UTF-8 encoded value for our acute E character. Let's jump back into the code as we can now better understand what's happening. The string variable we declared here has an underlying array of bytes which represents the UTF-8 encoding of the full string which looks like this. So when we were indexing our string here, what happened is that we're actually indexing the underlying byte array. This is why we got 114 which is the value of this byte. Note that if we index the string at the acute E index, we get this number which is the first half of the UTF-8 encoding of this character. So we wouldn't get back the proper 233 we would expect for this character. However, when iterating over the string using the range keyword, we got the proper 233 back. So the range keyword is doing some extra work for us here. It knows that our second character is a two byte character and decodes it correctly to 233. This is also why we see index two being skipped here. So again, a takeaway from this is that when you're dealing with strings in Go, you're dealing with a value whose underlying representation is an array of bytes. This is also why taking the length of a string is its length in the number of bytes and not the number of characters. An easier way to deal with iterating and indexing strings is to cast them to an array of runes rather than dealing with the underlying byte array of a string. For example, here's what we get when we do that with our string. So runes are just Unicode point numbers which represent the character. Now we can index this at the acute E index and get back 233 as we would expect. Note that runes are just an alias for int32. Also now when we're iterating, we get back the continuous index. Note we can declare a rune type using a single quote like this as well. Finally, let's cover string building. As we saw before, we can concatenate strings using the plus symbol like this. Note though, the strings are immutable in Go, meaning I cannot modify them once created. So it follows that when we're concatenating a string and assigning it to a variable like this, we're actually creating a completely new string every time, which is pretty inefficient. Instead, we can import Go's built-in strings package and create a string builder. Instead of using the plus operator, we call the write string method and finally call the string method at the end. What's happening here is an array is allocated internally and values are appended when calling the write string method. Only at the end is a new string created from the appended values. Much faster. In this video, let's take a look at how structs and interfaces are used in Go. First, you can think of structs as a way of defining your own type. So to create a struct, we can use the type keyword because again, we're defining a type here, the name of our type, followed by the struct keyword and curly braces. Structs can hold mixed types in the form of fields, which we can define by name. So here I defined a gas engine type. It holds a miles per gallon field of type unsigned int eight and a gallons field of the same type, which represents how many gallons of fuel are left. If we go to our main function, we can now create a new variable like this, which is a gas engine type. Because we haven't defined the miles per gallon or gallons field yet, this is a zero valued struct, meaning default values are set for the fields. So these are zero for our two fields since these are unsigned into eight types. One way to set these values is to use the struct literal syntax like this. We can also omit the field names and the fields are assigned values in order. We can also set the values by name directly like this as well. The fields can be pretty much anything you want, even another struct. For example, here is our owner struct, which has the name of the person who owns this car engine. We can create an owner info field here of type owner. So the owner information can be accessed using owner info .name. We also have another option, which is to directly put in the owner type like this. Now, instead of having an owner info field with a name subfield, we're adding the subfields directly. In other words, we can just use the dot name syntax. So the gas engine has these three fields now. Actually, we can do this with any type. So for example, like this with an int type. Now we have a field called int, which is also of type int. All right, let's just revert back to our miles per gallon and gallons fields again. Note that you can also declare anonymous structs where you aren't defining a name type like we did here. With an anonymous struct, we have to define it and initialize it in the same location. So we could create a similar struct type to our gas engine type like this. The main difference is that this is not reusable. If I want to create another struct like this again, I have to rewrite the definition. Now structs also have a concept of methods which we can use as well. These are functions which are directly tied to the struct and have access to the struct instance itself. Let's say we wanna make a method which calculates the miles left on a gas tank. Let's paste that in and go through the method. Except for this part here, a method is just like a function. In this case, we return an unsigned int eight. Now what we're doing in this first part is we're assigning this function to the gas engine type. This function or method now also has access to the fields and even other methods I've assigned to this gas engine type. So when we go down to our main function, we can call this method like this. If you come from other programming languages, this is very similar to classes where we are instantiating a class here and calling one of its methods. 
Now I can pass in this new type to functions like this. So this function takes in a gas engine type parameter and a miles parameter and checks if you can drive that distance. Now suppose I have different engine types. Instead of just a gas engine, I also have an electric engine type. The electric engine has different fields. For example, instead of miles per gallon, now it has miles per kilowatt hour. And instead of gallons, it has kilowatt hours, which specifies how much charge is left in the battery. It also has a similar miles left method. Now currently our can make it function only takes in gas engines, but what if we wanted to make this more general and allow it to take in any engine type? Well, this is where interfaces come in. Let's define an interface and see how this can help us here. We use similar syntax to defining a struct, except we use the interface keyword. In our can make it function, we see the only method we really need here is the miles left method, which takes no parameters and returns an unsigned int eight. This is called the method signature. We can specify this signature within the interface like this. In our can make it method, instead of having a very specific requirement that our E parameter must be a gas engine, we can replace this with our interface. This function can now take anything for this parameter with the only requirement being that the object has a miles left method with the signature we specified in our interface. This is now much more general and we can apply this function to a wider range of engine types. So we can see why this is a really useful tool in Go. All right, so let's answer the question, what are pointers and how are they used in Golang? To start, pointers are actually a special type. These are variables which store memory locations rather than values like integers or floats, for example. To create a pointer, we use the star syntax. So this line of code states that the variable p will hold the memory address of an in32 value. Let's also create a regular in32 variable and call this i. Here on the right is how these variables might look like in memory. The variable p is going to store a pointer or memory address, which itself takes up 32 or 64 bits, depending on your OS. In my case, this is 64 bits or 8 bytes. Now this pointer is initially nil because we haven't initialized it yet. In other words, this pointer doesn't yet point to anything, or yet another way to say this, this pointer does not have an address assigned to it in which to store an in32 value yet. To give this pointer an address, we can use the built-in new function. What this does is it gives us back a free memory location, which is 32 bits wide, which P can use to store an in32 value. Now we can see P stores a memory location, i.e. it points to this memory location down here. So at the beginning of the video, I said pointers are special types of variables. This is true, but pointers still share a lot in common with regular variables we've seen before. They still have a memory address themselves and they store a value at that address. In the case of a pointer, this is another memory address. If we want to get the value stored at this memory location, we can use the star symbol like this. This is called dereferencing the pointer. We can see that we get a zero back because this is a default value for in32. In fact, when you initialize a pointer with a memory location, it zeroes out that memory location. In other words, it sets the value at that memory location to the zero value of that type. For example, zero for in32, the empty string for strings, and false for booleans. To change the value stored at the memory location of a pointer, we use the star notation again and assign a value. So this line says set the value at the memory location p is pointing to to 10. Note the star notation does double duty, which may be a little confusing. Here we use it to tell the compiler that we want to initialize a pointer. But on these two lines, we use it to tell the compiler that we want to reference the value of the pointer. So these are two separate roles the star syntax has that you should keep in mind. Another common source of headaches is trying to get or set the value of a nil pointer. So if we don't call the new function, we don't see any compiler errors, but when we run this code, we get a nil pointer exception. In other words, we get a runtime error. What's happening here is we didn't assign a memory address to our pointer, so we obviously can't get the value at a memory address that doesn't exist. So make sure your pointer is at nil before trying to assign values to it. Next, we can also create a pointer from the address of another variable using the ampersand symbol like this. The ampersand symbol here means that we want the memory address of the variable, not its value. So P now refers to the memory address of I. In other words, both P and I reference the same in32 value in memory. If I use a star notation again to change the value of P, the value of I is now also changed. This is different from when you're using a regular variable. For example, if you create a new variable k and set i to k, so what your program will do here is copy the value of k into i's memory location. The main exception of this copy behavior of non-pointer variables is when working with slices. Let's say I copy a slice in the regular way without using a pointer. Now let's try modifying the slice copy variable and printing out the values of our two slices again. We can see that actually the values of our original slice have changed. This is because under the hood, slices contain pointers to an underlying array. 
check out my award-winning video here, which goes into details about how slices work. But basically with slices, we're just copying pointers when we do this. So both variables refer to the same data. Just something to know so you don't pull your hair out when debugging. All right, so moving on to using pointers and functions. These two go really nicely together, similar to subscribing and hitting the like button. Let's see why by looking at an example. So here's a function which takes in a float64 array of size 5 and squares all the values. Let's print the memory locations of thing1 in the main function and thing2 in our square function. Here we can see that their memory addresses are different, meaning these are two different arrays. Therefore, we can modify the values of thing2 without affecting the values of thing1 in our main function. But we're also doubling our memory usage of the variables passed in because we're creating a copy for use in our function. So we're potentially using way more memory than we need. Well, not anymore. Instead, let's use pointers. We can make our function take in a pointer to an array instead. Now we can see that the memory locations of these two arrays are the same. Pointers are really useful when passing in large parameters so you don't have to create copies of the data every time you call a function, wasting time and memory. Instead, you can just pass in a pointer to the data. The only thing to be mindful of now is that since thing1 and thing2 refer to the same array, changing the values of thing2 means the values of thing1 also change. How's it going, y'all? In this video, let's jump straight in and learn about Go routines. Let's start the insanity. Mm, giddy up. So Go routines are a way to launch multiple functions and have them execute concurrently. So first off, concurrency is not the same as parallel execution. Concurrency means that I have multiple tasks in progress at the same time. One way I can do this is by jumping back and forth from working on one task to another. Let's say task one involves a database call, which takes three seconds to return data. In concurrent programming, while I'm waiting for the database to respond, the CPU can move on to working on task two in the meantime. Then when I get a response, maybe I move back to finish up task one, then maybe move back again to finish up task two. Another way to achieve concurrency is through parallel execution. Instead of having one CPU core working on these two tasks, I can have two. Then their execution can happen simultaneously. So the execution here is still concurrent because we have multiple tasks in progress at the same time, but also these tasks are running in parallel. So we can see that a program may be running concurrently, but may not necessarily be executing tasks in parallel. In practice though, in Go, we usually do achieve some level of parallel execution using Go routines, as long as you have a multi-core CPU, which you probably do. Okay, let's check out how to use Go routines in our code. Here we have a function which simulates a call to a database retrieving an ID from the list here. This takes a random amount of time, up to two seconds per call, and we call this mock database five times. Now we can call this database sequentially one by one, which will take an average of five seconds to complete. A better way to do this is to let these database calls run concurrently. To do this, we use the go keyword in front of the function you want to run concurrently. Now our program won't wait for this function to complete, rather it'll keep moving on to the next step in the loop. If we run this code like this though, we see that nothing happens. So our program spawned these tasks in the background, didn't wait for them to finish, and then exited the program before they were complete. So we need a way for our program to wait until all these tasks have completed and then continue on to the rest of the code. This is where wait groups come in, which can be imported through the sync package. We can then create a wait group like this. Wait groups are pretty simple. They're pretty much just counters. Whenever we spawn a new Go routine, we make sure to add one to the counter like this. And inside the function, we then call the done method at the end like this. This decrements the counter. Finally, at the end, we call the wait method. This method is going to wait for the counter to go back down to zero, meaning that all the tasks have completed, and then the rest of the code will execute. Now what if instead of just printing out the results to the console, we wanted to return them to the main function? Well first off, let's make a slice where we can store all the results from the database. In the db call function, let's append the value we get back from our fake database. I'm also going to remove the randomness from the delay and set it to 2 seconds. This way we can see what happens when our slice is modified at the same time by multiple go routines. Now when you have multiple threads modifying the same memory location at the same time, you can get some unexpected results. For example, two processes writing to the same memory location at the same time could lead to corrupt memory, as well as a whole host of other issues. So we can't run this code, scratch that we can, but we really shouldn't run this code like this. 
Instead, we can use what is called a mutex to control the writing to our slice in a way that makes it safe in a concurrent program like ours. We can create a mutex again from the sync package like this. This is short for mutual exclusion. The two main methods are the lock and the unlock method, and we'll place them around the part of our code which accesses the result slice. What happens here is that when a Go routine reaches this lock method, a check is performed to see if a lock has already been set by another Go routine. If it has, it will wait here until the lock is released and then set the lock itself. Once it's done tinkering with our results array, the lock is released again with the unlock method and now other Go routines can obtain a lock as needed. One thing other tutorials don't seem to mention is that it really matters where you put your lock and unlock statements. If I were to put the lock statement here, this code would work, but it would totally destroy the concurrency of our database calls. If you don't see why that is, pause the video and try to figure it out yourself using what we just learned about the lock and unlock methods. One drawback of this sort of mutex is that it completely locks out other Go routines to accessing our result slice. Now you might want this, but you might not. Go provides another type of mutex called a read-write mutex. This has all the same functionality of the mutex we saw before, and the lock and unlock method work exactly the same. But we now also have a read-lock and read-unlock method as well. For readability and improving our code, let's make a few separate functions here to read and write from the result slice. The part here where we read the result, we can add a read lock and a read unlock. So when a Go routine reaches this line, it checks if there's a full lock on the mutex. By full lock, I mean the lock type we saw before where we called the lock method. If this full lock exists, it'll wait until it's released before continuing. This way we're not reading while the results are potentially being written to. If no full lock exists, the Go routine will acquire a read lock and then proceed with the rest of the code. Note that many Go routines may hold read locks at the same time. These read locks will only block code execution up here. When a Go routine hits this line, in order to proceed, all locks must be cleared, that is full locks and read locks. This prevents us from accessing the slice while other Go routines are writing to or reading from the slice just like before. So in summary, this pattern allows multiple Go routines to read from our slice at the same time, only blocking when writes may be potentially be happening. This is in contrast to what we saw before with the lock and unlock method with a regular mutex. In that case, even reads of the data can only happen one at a time. All right, let's move on to look at performance improvements in a little more detail. For the sake of illustration, let's just simplify our code here. So all our DB call function does is sleep for two seconds. Now I can call this method a thousand times if I wanted and my program will still finish in about two seconds. The reason for this is obviously not because I have a thousand cores to process all of these Go routines in parallel, but because this function really isn't doing anything after two seconds and the CPU can move on to starting the next Go routine. If I have more computationally expensive tasks though, the performance gain we get is going to be limited by the amount of cores we have. For example, here's a task which just counts to 100 million. Generally, this takes about 40 milliseconds on my machine. Now, if I call this a thousand times within this loop, it takes about 5.8 seconds to finish. So in this case, these Go routines need to actually do some work, and because I have eight cores in my machine, I can run eight of these Go routines at once. The rest of the Go routines need to wait until I have a CPU core available. Here I have plots of the execution time by the number of iterations set for the loop. Now with the DB call method, we got pretty much constant time, no matter how many Go routines we spawn together. You can expect similar results if the bulk of your function time is waiting for a database response. On the other hand, if your function is computationally expensive, the amount of improvement you'll get with parallelization is a function of the amount of cores in your CPU. In this video, we're gonna cover channels and how they work with Go routines. So at a high level, you can think of channels as a way to enable Go routines to pass around information. The main features of a channel are number one, they hold data, for example, an integer, a slice, or anything else really. Two, they're thread safe, i.e. we avoid data races when we're reading and writing from memory. And three, we can listen when data is added or removed from a channel, and we can block code execution until one of these events happens. Let's see how channels work in code. So to make a channel, we use the make function followed by the chan key keyword than the type of value we want the channel to hold. So this channel can only hold a single int value. Channels also have a special syntax, i.e. we use an arrow like this to add the value 1 to this channel. 
We can think of a channel as containing an underlying array. In this case, we have what's called an unbuffered channel, which only has enough room for one value. Now we can retrieve the value from a channel using similar syntax, and we can set that to a variable. So here the value one gets popped out of the channel, the channel is now empty, and the variable i now holds a value one. Suppose we just ran the code like this. We end up getting a deadlock error. Now understanding why we get this error is really instructive as to how channels work. When we write to an unbuffered channel, the code will block until something else reads from it. So in effect, we'll be waiting here forever, unable to reach the line where we actually read from the channel. Luckily, Go's runtime is smart enough to notice this and will just throw a deadlock error rather than your code hanging here forever. So clearly this isn't the way channels are meant to be used. Instead, let's use them properly in conjunction with Go routines. Let's create a process function which takes in a channel and writes a value to it. Next, let's call this as a Go routine up here and print the value that gets set by our Go routine. Note that here I'm directly printing the value popped out from the channel rather than setting it to a variable first. Okay, so let's step through this code. So we start our Go routine and the program moves to the print statement where it waits for a value to be set in the channel. In our Go routine, we set the value and exit the function. Then our main function notices that a value has been set and the print function gets called and the value gets printed. Pretty simple. Now what if we add values from zero to four to this channel in a loop like this? So of course we have to read from the channel multiple times in our main function as well. We could surround this with the same loop here, but now the process has to know how many times it needs to read from the channel. Instead, for loops can actually work with channels in a really nice way. We can iterate over the channel itself by using the range keyword. Now I here is the value of the channel. So let's step through this code again. We create the channel and we start the go routine. In the main function, we wait at the top of the for loop for something to be added to the channel. In the process function, we set up the for loop and add zero to the channel. We wait until the main function reads from the channel and then in a concurrent way, both the value is printed and the number one is added to the channel at about the same time. This then continues until I is equal to five. Now if we run this code, our old friend the deadlock error will happen again. This is because after we print all of our values from 0 to 4, the main function will go back to wait at the top of the loop for another value. But just like me on Tinder, after 5 messages, it'll get ghosted by the process function, which won't send any more messages, and we get the deadlock error. What we have to do is before exiting a process, we can close the channel like this. This notifies any other process using this channel that we're done, and our main function will break out of the loop and exit. In fact, let's use a defer statement. In Go, this just means do this stuff right before the function exits. Okay, so let's expand on the topic of channels slightly and look at a buffer channel. These are very similar to what we saw, except now we can store multiple values in the channel at the same time. We can create a buffer channel which can store five integers like this. Okay, so how is this actually helpful? Well, let's say we want to do some work first before printing out the value. This takes one second. When we run the code with a regular channel, the process function stays active until the main function is done with the channel. But there's really no need for the process function to hang around. It can finish its work quickly and just exit and let the main function do its thing. By using a buffer of five, the process function can add up to five values in the channel without having to wait for the main function to make room in the channel by popping out a value here. Running like this, we see that the process this function finishes almost immediately while the main function is still running reading the values in the channel. All right, now obviously these are all pretty dumb programs, so let's make a more realistic program and see how channels are actually useful. Let's make a little program which mocks checking for sales on chicken fingers at Walmart, Costco, and Whole Foods. If it finds a sale, it'll send me a text message with this function, notifying me of the sale on chicken fingers. So this channel is going to hold the website we found the sale on. Let's also make a check chicken prices function which takes in the website we want to check and the channel. We're going to make a for loop which every second checks the website for the price of chicken and if it's below our threshold it will set the value of the channel to the website let's spawn three go routines and then send a message when a deal is found so there are three go routines running at the same time checking these three websites and the send message function is waiting here for a value to be added to the channel to send off the text so the first go routine to find a deal on chicken will <laughs> trigger the text message and the program will exit. All right, so let's also cover the concept of select statements using this example. Suppose I also want to track the price of tofu. We have a similar check tofu prices function, which we also run as a go routine, as well as a separate tofu channel. So when we find a bargain on tofu, we write to this channel. Let's also pass this channel into the send message function. Now, if we find a deal on tofu, we don't really care that much. So instead of sending a text, we want to send ourselves an email. So let's paste in a select statement, which is going to help us here. So this is like an if statement for channels. What happens is if we receive a message from the chicken channel, we set the variable website to the value in the channel and we execute this statement. Otherwise, if we receive a message from the tofu channel, we execute this statement. So this select statement will listen for a result. Once it gets one, it'll execute one of these statements and then exit.
All right, so let's check out how generics work in Go. If you've worked in a statically typed language before, you might have ran into this problem. Here I have a function which sums up the values of an integer slice. But a bit down the line, I also want a similar function for a float32 slice. All right, so now we can rename this function to sum in slice and then create a sum float32 slice function. And for float64, the same thing and so on. Now these are all pretty much the same functions and so it'd be nice not to have to repeat the code like this. Now different typed programming languages solve this problem in different ways, but for Golang we use generics. So we can collapse all of this into a single sum slices function which handles all cases. Let's explain what this code does. So we can think of generics here as a way of allowing a function to receive additional parameters within these square brackets. Except instead of a value, we're passing in a type. And here this function will only accept an int, float32, or float64 type. We can see that we pass in an int type up here. So everywhere we have the letter t, you can replace it in your head with int. This function takes in an input of a slice of ints and returns an int. The sum variable here is also of type int. Now we can call this same function for a float32 for example and it's all good. Now we also have the any type which we can use in certain situations with generics as well. We can't for example use it here to allow all variable types. This is because not all types are compatible with the addition operator. For example you can't add booleans together. But here's an example where it does make sense to use the any type. This function checks whether a slice is empty. This works no matter what the slice is made up of. Note that actually in these cases, we can even omit the square bracket type inputs here. This is because the Go compiler is smart enough to infer the type, since if we pass in a slice of ints, then t is inferred to be an int. But there are cases where we can't infer the type of our generic parameter. For example, here's a function where I'm loading some JSON file, and then unmarshalling it into one of these two struct types. Now here, unmarshalling, by the way, means loading the JSON string into a struct. For example, if our JSON looks like this, then we end up with a struct that looks like this. This is a case where we need to pass in the struct type, because otherwise the function won't know what struct to unmarshal our JSON string into. For example, we may be loading many different types of JSONs using this function, and the compiler needs to know what struct type to unmarshal the data into. Speaking of structs, generics can also be used with struct types, not just functions. For example, here we have a gas engine and electric engine type. We can create a car type which has a make, model, and also an engine field. We can make this capable of being both a gas and an electric engine by using generics in a very similar way. Now we can instantiate two types of cars by setting the engine value to gas engine here and electric engine here. So to be honest, I tend to use generics almost exclusively with functions, but you can use them also with structs like this as well. And that's about it for generics. Very simple and very useful, which is a good combination. All right, let's put everything we learned in the previous tutorials together and make an API in Go. Before we start, I just want to note that I'm going to assume that you have some level of knowledge of how RESTful APIs work. It's not strictly necessary for this video, but it's a nice to have. All right, so this is what our API is going to look like in the end. Here I'm using Postman for testing this API. We're going to make an account slash coins endpoint, which we can use to look up the amount of coins someone has in some imaginary account. We got a parameter, which is a username, and the authorization token in the header, which we're using to authorize the call. So this tutorial is going to cover Go code structures, authentication, middleware, and installing and importing external packages. Let's create our project with Go mod in it and the name of our module. So in my case, I'll use my GitHub repo for this project where you can check out the code for this tutorial. So first, let's start with the structure of our project. Many Go projects adhere to a standard layout, which I'll vaguely follow here. Though note, you don't have to follow this structure for your future projects. Do what works for you. Not to worry. I have a permit. This just says I can do what I want. You can read more about this by Googling Golang project structure and you'll find a GitHub repo detailing what code should go in what folder. Okay, so we'll have an API folder. Here we're going to have our specs, things like parameters and response types for our endpoint. This is also where you could put your YAML spec file. I'm not going to cover creating a YAML file as it isn't strictly needed and it's not the topic of this video. Next, we're going to have a CMD slash API folder, which will contain our main.go file. And we're going to have an internal folder. This will contain most of the code for this API. Let's start in our API folder and let's create an API.go file. Here, let's write out the parameters and the responses of our endpoint. Let's start with some imports, which we're going to use in a bit. We'll make a few structs, which will represent our parameters for our endpoint and responses. First, we have our coin balance param struct, which represents the parameters our API endpoint will take. In this case, we'll just require the username. 
Second, we have the coin balance response struct. This outlines the successful response from the server containing a status code and the account balance. Next, we have an error struct representing the response returned when an error occurs. So we got the response code as well as an error message. Okay, so now let's define our main package in cmd slash api slash main.go. By the way, if you like this series or this video so far, make sure to tap those like and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. All right, let's note a few things from our package imports. First, in our API, we'll use the Chi package. This is a pretty flexible and easy to use package for web development, though there are a bunch of others you could use. Second, we're gonna be importing a package from our own module here in the internal slash handlers folder. Lastly, let's use logris to log errors for debugging. When we import an external package like logris or Chi, we can install it using go mod tidy. Now in our go.mod file, we can see that we have these two packages listed out. All right, sweet. So now let's go back to our main function. To start, let's set up our logger so that when we print something out, we get the file and the line number. To do this, we call the set report caller function, passing in true to turn this on. Now we create a new chi mux variable using the new router function, which returns a pointer to a mux type which is really just a struct which we'll use to set up our API. We're gonna pass this into our handler function, which we'll define in a second in our internal slash handlers folder. Remember, we imported this package up here. This will set up our router, i.e. add the endpoint definitions that we want. Let's add a print statement and then another cooler print statement. And then let's start the server with our HTTP package. This takes the base location of your server, which in our case is just localhost on port 8000, as well as a handler, which our mux type satisfies. And then of course, let's log any errors we might have when starting the server. Okay, so now let's actually create this handler function, which will set up our router. This is in our internal slash handlers package under the api.go file. So let's define our handler function, which takes in that mux type we just created. Note that our handler function starts with a capital H. So this just tells the compiler that the function can be imported in other packages. If I started with a lowercase, then this would have been a private function, which could only be used in this handlers package. The main package would not be able to import it as we did. Now let's cover the concept of middleware. So middleware is essentially a function that gets called before the primary function, which handles the endpoint. Let's look at a few examples of how we're going to use middleware. You can add middleware to a route by using the r.use function. So first we're going to add a piece of global middleware. This is going to be the strip slashes function. This is a pre-built function we are grabbing from Chi's middleware package. Global middleware means that this middleware is applied all the time. So in other words, to all endpoints we make. This strip slashes function will make sure that the trailing slashes will always be ignored. Otherwise we'd get a 404 error if we included the slash like this. All right, so time to set up our route. To do this, we call r.route, which takes in the path, which is slash account for us, as well as an anonymous function, which takes in a chi router as a parameter. We can now use this router to define our get method. But first, let's add another piece of middleware to this route where we can check if the user is authorized to access this data first. We'll create this authorization function in our middleware package later. Now, every request which wants to access an endpoint starting with slash account has to pass through this authorization function first. If the authorization fails, the function Will return an error as a response and the rest of the code won't get executed. So this function essentially acts like a nightclub bouncer. If you don't have the proper ID, you can't come in here. We'll create a get method inside this route with the slash coins path, which will be handled by the get coin balance function. We'll define this function later as well. So we just created an endpoint that's now at slash account slash coins. All right, so now we got to define our authorization and our get coin balance functions. Let's start with the authorization function. We'll put this in our internal slash middleware slash authorization dot go file. First, let's create a custom unauthorized error, which we're going to use in this function. So because we're using our authorization function as middleware, this needs to follow a certain signature, i.e. it needs to take in and return an HTTP handler interface. Now we can make this function return an HTTP handler like this. We're using the handler func in the HTTP package. So this takes in a function which itself takes in a response writer and a pointer to the request. So the response writer is what you use to construct a response to the caller. For example, set the response body, the headers, and the status code. The request is what contains all the information about the incoming request. For example, headers, payload, and other information about the HTTP request which came in. Now in here is where we're going to define all our logic for authorizing the HTTP request. Now we can grab the username parameter from the request point 
pointer by calling r.url.query.get and then the name of the parameter, which for us is username. We can also grab the auth token from the header like this. Now, if either of these are empty, we can return an error. To do this, let's go back to our API slash API.go file. Here, let's create a function which we can use to write an error response to the HTTP response writer. In other words, this function is going to return an error response to the person who called the endpoint. We want to make a function here because we're going to reuse this in multiple places in our code when we want to return an error. Let's call this the write error function. So it takes in the writer, the message we want to return, and the status code. We're going to use our error struct and write a few things to our response writer. So here we set the content type, i.e. we want to return a JSON, the error code like this. And finally, we write the error struct out, which is going to be what the user gets back in the response. Now, we're not going to call this directly in our functions when we want to return an error because we want to have a couple of types of error responses. So let's make a few wrappers to this function. So this request error handler is going to take in the response writer and the error. We're going to use this when we want to return a specific error in our response. This might guide the caller to fix a request. So for example, if the username wasn't passed in, we might want to return a message which says username required or something like that. On the other hand, we'll use the internal error handler when we want to return a generic error message. For example, if the error is a result of a bug in our code, we don't need to return a detailed message to the user because it's not all that helpful for them. Okay, so if we go back to our authorization function, we can log out the error to the console and then call our new request error handler passing in an unauthorized error, and then exiting the function with return. Now, if we have both of these things, we can proceed to getting data from our database and checking the username and authorization token is correct. So we're gonna instantiate a pointer to our database like this using an interface type and call the new database method. Don't worry, we're gonna define all these functions and types later. If we get an error back, we'll return an internal error in this case. Now let's actually query the database using the get user login details method. Then finally, if we didn't find a client with a username or the token doesn't match what we got back from our database, again, we're going to return a request error. At the end of this function, we need to call the next.serve HTTP method. What this does is it calls the next middleware in line or the handler function for the endpoint if there's no middleware left. So in our case, this will call our get coin balance function at the end, which we'll make in a bit. And there's our authorization function. Let's go ahead and create our database interface now. We're going to create this in internal slash tool slash database dot go. So first let's define the types of data our database should return. These will look like this. So login details and coin details. The former contains the auth token for validating the request and the latter has the coin balance. Now the database interface is going to define a few methods that are required for our API. We're using an interface here because we can swap out our databases really easily, as long as we define a get user login details method, a get user coins method, and a setup database method with these signatures. All right, now that we've defined our interface and the return types, let's create a function called new database, which returns this interface. Inside, we're going to create a database variable and set it to a mock DB struct. This is a struct we're going to create, which is going to implement our interface. Then we call the setup database method, do the standard error checks, and return the pointer. Now let's create this mock database in internal slash tool slash mock db dot go. We'll create a mock db type and let's create some data. Here we have some login details data as well as some coin details data. Now these just represent some fake data and in a real world app, this would probably just be stored in some form of database. Remember, in order for this mock db struct to conform to our database interface, we need to create a get user login details, get coin details, and set up database methods. So our two get methods will just look up the data in the maps we defined above and the setup database function for our mock database just does nothing. Okay, so if we go back to our API handler, we still need to define our get coin balance function. Now in order to use this function in this get method, we need to define it such that it takes in a response writer and a pointer to the request as parameters. So let's do that as our final step here in the same handler package. Let's create a get coin balance .go file. Here we're assuming the call is already ran through the authorization middleware, so we just need to grab the username from the parameters passed in. The easiest and most Go-like way to do this is to decode the parameters into our coin balance param struct, which we made earlier. We can use the gorilla slash schema package for this, calling the new decoder function. So this line is just going to basically grab the parameters in the URL and set them to the values in the struct. Now in this case, it'll just grab the username from the URL and put it into the username field in the struct. Now the rest of this function is very straightforward. So we again instantiate a database interface, call the get user coins method, set the value to our response struct, and write it to the response writer. And that's it. Let's go test our awesome API. 
So if we call our API, we get the token balance back for Alex. If we enter an incorrect authorization, we get a 400 error. If we enter in a username which doesn't exist, another 400 error. We can also query another username like Marie and get back her coin balance as well. All right, so there we go. We just built an API and go with authentication. Make sure you like and subscribe as I got some new stuff coming out, less tutorial oriented, but should be a lot of fun. I'll see you then.